so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to my discussion video on February's chapters of Our Mutual Friend in my ongoing Victorian serialised read-along. So after January's miraculous being on time with the videos, I am slightly behind again. I did manage to read February's chapters during February but it is now March when I am filming this video but I am sure we will all survive and hopefully I will manage to get March's video up in time during the month of March. I blame the fact that February was a short month anyway. So in the month of February we read three chapters of Our Mutual Friend which were the final three chapters of book two of four of Our Mutual Friend. Book two chapter 24, Strong of Purpose. Chapter 25, The Whole Case So Far, a very fine chapter. And 26, an anniversary occasion. There are very many exciting things to talk about today. So in January's chapters of Our Mutual Friend, we discovered that Mr. Rokesmith is in fact Mr. Harmon, as many people had predicted. And I did enjoy reading the comments on last month's video and discovering that many people had expected that, but not everyone had. And that does lead into many interesting things. And there are so many dramatic occurrences going on in the end of book two, including another very, very good, interesting proposal scene. But anyway, before I get ahead of myself, because I have a lot to say on that chapter, the whole case so far. And as I've mentioned before, Bradley Headstone is like, one of the best characters in all of Dickens in my opinion, one of the most fascinating characters in all of Dickens. Chapter 24, Strong of Purpose. So chapter 24 being entitled Strong of Purpose has sort of two meanings there. It partly refers to what the first half of this chapter deals with which is John Rokesmith slash John Harmon. Again let's just call him John. I can't think of him as John, I think of him forever as Mr Rokesmith but that, that is his actual name, his actual name is John. John is very determined that he shall remain hidden, he shall remain John Rokesmith rather than becoming John Harmon. And it is really sad, especially when he's talking to Bella's father who's like, oh don't you think my daughter's really pretty in a slightly odd but nonetheless proud way, and John Rokesmith who, who loves her very dearly but will never be able to marry her and all of that sadness just has to deal with it. So I do enjoy the kind of sadness of that part of the chapter. And the second half of this chapter also deals with someone else who is strong of purpose and that is Betty Higdon. Betty Higdon is a fascinating character in terms of Dickens and gender as I'll talk a bit more about in a minute and she is determined that she is going to run away from Sloppy, that she is going to leave Sloppy to have his fortune made by the boffins while she goes off working on her own in order that he can have the life that she wants him to have and she can carry on doing what she thinks will be best for her as well. So to talk about some interesting things in this chapter. I think one of the things that is so sad in this chapter is when John is reflecting on just how wrong his plans had gone. Like his original plan to disguise himself as someone else in order to watch Bella and see if she was looking forward to being married to him or not has just gone so far wrong. Like everything got so out of hand and now he's kind of stuck in this situation that he didn't ever intend to be in. And I think the way that Dickens writes about that is really kind of moving. It was meant to be harmless. It was to last but a few hours or days. It was to involve in it only the girl so capriciously forced upon him and upon whom he was so capriciously forced. And it was honestly meant well towards her. For if he had found her unhappy in the prospect of that marriage through her heart inclining to some other man or for any other cause, he would have seriously have said, this is another of the old perverted uses of the misery making money. I will let it go to my and my sister's only protectors and friends. There are lots of times in the book where John Harmon not exactly behaves badly but you know he li he is lying to a lot of people and that is problematic and I'll talk about this more as we go later on in the book but he is lying to a lot of people and that is slightly problematic but at the same time you do feel especially I think in this chapter that he has just dug himself into this terrible hole that he can't get out of and he really didn't mean to dig himself into this terrible hole which he cannot get out of and now it's just making him miserable from every angle and that is sad but to move on to I think the more central aspect of this chapter which is that of Betty Higdon. So in this chapter Betty Higdon tells John Rokesmith and then the boffins that she is determined to leave Sloppy, to run away from Sloppy so that he can make his fortune while she can go and make hers. And the way that she describes it and the language she uses and the language Dickens uses to describe her is wonderful. So I did my undergrad dissertation quite a few years ago now on the way that Dickens presents gender in his novels and the way that his presentation of gender changes over time. One of the key aspects I looked at in terms of Dickens's changing presentation of gender is how his representation of gender and work and gender and duty changes over time. There is a great kind of conflict at the heart of Dickens's ideas and his idealisms towards gender to do with women and work because Dickens's ideal female character in so many of his books is someone who is hardworking, who is diligent, who is intelligent, like that's important for him, for women to be, but also his ideal woman is really domestic and therefore the issue of women working becomes a really complicated and fascinating issue in Dickens as in many Victorian writers. Part of his female ideal is to do with working hard and 
being independent when necessary, but also part of his female duty is to do with domesticity and not working when not required. So up until our mutual friend, in much of Dickens, we have women who work, we have female characters who are workers, but in general the work they do is either work that is considered by Victorian society to be feminine, so you know, they're being a housekeeper or a governess, they're doing something which is considered female by Victorian society, or they're working to support their family, they're working to support their loved ones, and supporting the family is within the kind of Victorian female sphere, that's okay, Dickens doesn't mind that. Up until our mutual friend, in general the female working characters in Dickens, the female workers, are working in more kind of domestic female spheres or they're working to support their families. There are exceptions, like for example Rachel in Hard Times is quite an interesting character to look at in terms of women working, but in general the working women in Dickens work out of necessity, work to care for their family, and work in kind of traditional female spheres. But Our Mutual Friend becomes much more interesting in terms of looking at working women, and I think there are three characters where it's really, really important. One is Jenny Wren, one is Lizzie Hexham, and one is Betty Higdon. Because Betty Higdon is an old lady who is offered the choice. She is offered patronage and money, she is offered support by the boffins, and she says, no, I want to go and work for myself because that is what I want to do. And she goes off to work for herself in order to earn herself a living because she wants that respect that she will feel for herself in being independent, because she wants to work, because she enjoys working. For her, that keeps the deadness off, that makes her feel energetic and alive. She goes off to work for the sake of working because that is what she wants to do. She doesn't do it to support her family, all of her family are dead. She doesn't do it to support her surrogate family because Sloppy is provided for. She does it because that is what she wants to do. And Dickens describes her as a heroine and it makes me very happy. The way Betty describes her own ambitions and what she wants to do is really fascinating. I'd far better be a walking than a getting numbed and dreary. I'm a good fair knitter and can make many little things to sell. The loan from your old lady and gentleman of twenty shillings to fit a basket with will be a fortune for me. Trudging round the country and tiring of myself out, I shall keep the deadness off and get my own bread by my own labour. And what more can I want? I'm a getting to be an old one, but I'm a strong one too, and travel and weather never hurt me yet. And Dickens describes her as a brave old heroine. Dickens respects her for her independence and for her desire to work for herself, and this is very important and significant in terms of Dickens' presentation of gender and the way it changes throughout his books and the way it is so much better in Our Mutual Friend than in so many of the books before. I also think it's really important in terms of John's character how much he respects her for what she wants to do and the fact that he persuades the boffins to, to agree with her and to let her go. Before I move on to the next chapter though, I had quite forgotten about the conversation between Bradley Headstone and Mr Rooksmith in this chapter, which is a terribly, and at the times beautifully awkward, conversation that they have between them in which Bradley is just slowly seething with all of the rage about the connection between Lizzie Hexham and Eugene Rayburn's name. The secretary thought, as he glanced at the schoolmaster's face, that he had opened a channel here indeed, and that it was an unexpectedly dark and deep and stormy one and difficult to sound. So much drama and awkwardness between them and that conversation and Bradley's constrained manner kind of sets us up for all the drama of the chapter that's to come. But on to the next chapter, chapter 25, the whole case so far. This, I think, along with a solo duet and like another chapter that happens later on in the book are probably like my three favourite chapters of the novel. Like I think this chapter is brilliant. I've mentioned many times before, Bradley Headstone I think is Dickens's finest creation, a fascinating character, so well done, I think he's wonderful, like I could study him until the cows come home, like he's a wonderful exploration of one, like Victorian masculinity, two, like Victorian respectability and because respectability, as I've mentioned before, is like my pet favourite topic in Victorian literature, it's something I find fascinating, and I love how Bradley Headstone is a symbol of like broken respectability, of someone who has been bound so tightly by respectability that the moment he undergoes, like the moment he succumbs to some passionate feeling that respectable Victorian gentlemen are not meant to feel, everything breaks, everything goes terribly wrong. He is in his own way like a tragic hero, and the way he talks to Lizzie in this scene, the way he, the language he uses, he styles himself as a tragic hero, says things like, it is my doom, and it's just, oh it's great, it's so great. So in this chapter, Bradley Headstone proposes to Lizzie Hexham in a churchyard just for extra gothic drama. She says no, and then he becomes quite violent, begins to threaten Eugene Rayburn, or not threaten him, just repeat his name in his jealous rage, and it's just so, so well written. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be so like happy and enthusiastic about all the jealous rage and 
distress going on in this chapter but it is so good that I can't help but feel happy that this chapter and this book exists. After this has happened Bradley Headstone storms off, Charlie Hexham is infuriated with his sister for not accepting his friend, he gets angry with Lizzie, tells Lizzie that he is broken with her, that he is done with her forever. Lizzie is then found by Mr Raya, her friend, who says that he will accompany her home and then Eugene Rayburn turns up as well. Things of interest in this chapter this is going to be a long video, I have many things to say. So first off, in terms of the opening bit of this chapter where Charlie and Bradley are discussing, I think the way that Charlie looks at the world is quite interesting to view here. He looks at the world through eyes of sense and also of respectability, like everything to him is about being respectable, making way in the world, being better and about kind of what is sensible to do. Like his sense of what is right is to do with what is logical, emotion doesn't come in for, to it for him. So for example he says to Bradley Headstone, everything is on our side. Respectability, an excellent connection for me, common sense, everything. To him the idea that Lizzie would reject Bradley Headstone is just insane because it's not logical because he has a good social position and money and he's respectable and he's her brother's friend and for Charlie it would be great for him but also to his mind it would be great for Lizzie, great for Bradley Headstone. It's just win-win all around in terms of Charlie's perspective. The idea that Lizzie might not like Bradley doesn't really come into it. It's important one to show Charlie's selfishness but also to show his obsession with respectability and with logic over emotion. When he leaves Lizzie to see Bradley Headstone, this is what he says to her. He says, there, let go, be sensible. Now Liz, be a rational girl and a good sister. The things that he thinks she should take into consideration in terms of marrying Bradley are one, him and how it will affect Charlie because Charlie is very selfish and also sense, rationality, logic, that is what it is about to him not about emotion. And sense versus emotion, like logic versus love, is a really important theme in Dickens in general, like especially in Dombey and Son and Hard Times as well, um, just to go off on a slight tangent, it's a really interesting theme and certainly one that's worth looking out for in a lot of his books, especially because unfortunately and a bit annoyingly but also interestingly it's often to do with kind of male versus female, it's to do with a kind of feminine emotion versus masculine logic and although it's, it's, it's annoying and it's very Victorian and irritating that that is how the dichotomy is kind of explored in Dickens, but it's also interesting that femininity and emotion wins in pretty much every Dickens novel, like Dickens loves emotion. But yes, again a tangent I, I will discuss at some point else, not here. Back to Bradley Headstone. I just want to read you some of Bradley Headstone's lines in his proposal to Lizzie because it's wonderfully written, it's a masterful scene, like I think the way that Dickens writes Bradley in general is wonderful and in this scene there's just some fabulous like brilliant lines. It's so sad isn't it? It's so miserable but oh it's so good. You see me at my greatest disadvantage. It is most unfortunate for me that I wish you to see me at my best and I know that you see me at my worst. You are the ruin, the ruin, the ruin of me. I have no resources in myself, I have no confidence in myself, I have no government of myself when you are near me or in my thoughts and you are always in my thoughts now. I have never been quit of you since I first saw you. Oh that was a wretched day for me, that was a wretched miserable day. Bear with me. I am always wrong when you are in the question, it is my doom. You draw me to you. If I was shut up in a strong prison you would draw me out, I should break through the wall to come to you. If I were lying on a sick bed, you would draw me up to stagger to your feet and fall there. You are alarmed. It is another of my miseries that I cannot speak to you or speak of you without stumbling at every syllable unless I let the check go altogether and run mad. You have no reason to look alarmed. I can restrain myself and I will. You know what I am going to say. I love you. What other men may mean when they use that expression I cannot tell. What I mean is that I am under the influence of some tremendous attraction which I have resisted in vain and which overmasts me. You could draw me to fire, you could draw me to water, you could draw me to the gallows, you could draw me to any death, you could draw me to anything I have most avoided, you could draw me to any exposure and disgrace. This and the confusion of my thoughts, so that I am fit to nothing, is what I mean by your being the ruin of me. But if you would reward me with a favourable answer to my offer of myself in marriage, you could draw me to any good, every good with equal force. I only add that if it is any claim on you to be in earnest, I am in thorough, dreadful earnest. It's just... Oh, it's so beautifully written. Like, on the one hand, she really hates him and he's slightly scary at times, but on the other hand, it's a beautiful speech. And the way that Dickens writes it is so important because we feel for Bradley Headstone, of course we do, how can we not? Even though Lizzie doesn't like him and we know that, we do feel for him. And I'll talk a bit later in the chapter about the way that Eugene Rayburn behaves in this chapter. Like we know that Lizzie loves Eugene and that's that's all great, but the way that Eugene behaves later on in this chapter just makes you think so little of Eugene. And Dickens does a really clever thing where 
often in chapters that feature both Bradley Headstone and Eugene Rayburn, we see Bradley Headstone to his advantage and we see Eugene to his disadvantage. Obviously in this chapter we also see Bradley Headstone to his disadvantage when he goes a bit crazy later on, but in this speech when he does proclaim his love for Lizzie you believe him. When he says that he could draw her to any evil but also to any good you believe him and that's really important because he does, as I say, set himself up as a tragic hero. The way that he uses words like doom, the way that he talks about her being the ruin of him and the way that it's always her force. He doesn't take responsibility for his actions at the moment. It is all Lizzie's doing. He is being kind of compelled in his life by by her. It's really, really interesting and ah, oh, what a character. That line, I cannot speak to you or speak of you without stumbling at every syllable unless I let the check go altogether and run mad. The idea of his respectability binding him and checking him and stopping him feeling as he should, the fact that this restraint that he has always put upon himself makes his love and passion even stronger and more dramatic and dangerous almost when it does kind of break the check upon him. And then we have this very dramatic moment where Lizzie says no and he says then I hope I may never kill him and very conveniently strikes a gravestone which is lying by. Dickens always refers to them as the stones in this but they are in a churchyard so assumedly Bradley Headstone strikes a headstone. Isn't that wonderful? And at this point his love, his passion turns to anger, turns to mad jealousy in a really interesting way but it does give Lizzie the leave to tell him her thoughts and I think what she says to him is really powerful and really dramatic and shows quite a lot about her as a character. It is cowardly in you to speak to me in this way, but it makes me able to tell you that I do not like you and that I have never liked you from the first and that no other living creature has anything to do with the effect you have produced upon me yourself. And it's very interesting because what she stresses to him is that the fact that she will not marry him is not about her being in love with anyone else. It's nothing to do with Eugene Rayburn. She does not belong to any man and it's not that she won't marry him because of Eugene. She just won't marry him because of him. Him, and that's really important and I like that she says it, it makes me happy. The bit where Charlie breaks with his sister is again really interesting in terms of respectability and in terms of Charlie's selfishness. As Mr Headstone's wife you'll be occupying a most respectable station and you'll be holding a far better place in society than you hold now. That is what it is about for him, it is all about respectability. Although I feel it's worth pointing out that Bradley Headstone's crazy jealousy and smashing of headstones is probably not that respectable anyway. I am determined that after I have climbed up out of the mire you shall not pull me down. You can't disgrace me if I have nothing to do with you and I will have nothing to do with you in the future. You are an irrevocably bad girl and a false sister and I have done with you forever. I have done with you. It's really sad because we do see at the beginning of the book a connection between Charlie and his sister and that he loves her some way and it's got lost in his obsession with respectability and in his selfishness. I think especially reading it slowly this time around rather than it quite quickly I, I realised just what a dramatic change in Charlie's personality you see, just what a dramatic change we see in his relationship with Lizzie that is really sad and makes his rejection of her all the more powerful. And then Mr Riot appears who is as I have mentioned before a kind of male angel figure within our mutual friend. Dickens has a lot of female Male angels but Mr Raya is one of those few male angels. We have another in Tom Pinch in Martin Chuzzlewit and Mr Raya is definitely one in Our Mutual Friend. He comes to keep Lizzie company and he comes to kind of provide a force, to provide a shield for her, not only importantly from Bradley Headstone but also when he appears from Eugene Rayburn. Because it must be remembered that although Bradley Headstone is violent and slightly crazy but also you know beautifully in love in a kind of slightly terrifying way, Eugene also behaves badly and Eugene is also kind of careless about Lizzie, about her her feelings and also about her respectability in a way. As I said in this chapter we've obviously just witnessed Bradley Headstone behaving quite badly and irrationally but then we also see the way Eugene behaves here and it doesn't make him look great either partly because he refuses to leave Lizzie even though she asks him to but also the way that he treats Mr Raya is just so casually racist. He doesn't know his name, he doesn't ask it, he calls him Mr Aaron, he basically picks what he thinks is a Jewish sounding name, addresses that to Mr Raya and suggests that he should leave Lizzie and go to a synagogue. Much as he reduces Bradley Headstone to a stereotype by calling him schoolmaster rather than his name, he attempts to reduce Mr Raya to a stereotype. I was thinking reading this chapter, it's quite interesting, the way that Eugene Rayburn treats everyone around him. He basically attempts to reduce everyone apart from Mortimer and Lizzie to a stereotype. Even his father, who he calls MRF or 
Lady Tippings, like everyone in his life, with the exception of Mortimer and Lizzie, he attempts to reduce to a stereotype so that he can kind of dismiss them. And even Lizzie, he refuses to understand her properly. I think that's a great, really interesting bit in here where Dickens says that Eugene knew whatever he chose to know of the thoughts of her heart. He basically knows that Lizzie loves him, but he doesn't know it completely because he doesn't want to know it completely. He is, as Mr. Raya rightly points out at the end of this chapter, thoughtless. Thoughtless for the effect of his actions on Lizzie and also thoughtless for everyone else. He, a bit like Charlie, is quite selfish and he only chooses to understand anybody as much as he wants to and if he doesn't want to understand them he just dismisses them as a stereotype. I find Eugene a really interesting character. I think his language and his carelessness, his wit, makes him attractive in many ways, makes him an interesting character to read about. But at least at this stage of the book he's also not very nice and that is important to remember. So now let us talk about chapter 26 of book two, the final chapter of book two. So in this chapter we have a society chapter, a kind of review, a roundup to finish off book two of Our Mutual Friend in which we are once again in the present tense and we are seeing what is going on in society. In this chapter quite a few important things occur. We discover that it has been a year since the start of the book. This is the one year wedding anniversary of that very happy couple, the Lamleys. Another important aspect of this chapter is that through the discussion of society, we discover two important things about the plot. One is that Lizzie has received a kind of mysterious retraction of all the accusations against her father, which we know came through Mr. Rosemith slash John Harlan, who of course knows that Lizzie's father was nothing to do with the matter. And the other important thing to know is that Lizzie has disappeared, voluntarily disappeared. She has run away, she has distanced herself from Bradley Headstone and Eugene Rayburn and left, and that everybody, including Eugene Rayburn, has been unable to find her. And the other really interesting thing that happens in this chapter, which I think is the, the most interesting thing in this chapter and a fascinating aspect of the book, is that Sophrania Lamley confides in Mr. Tremlow that her and Mr. Lamley have been plotting to marry Georgiana to Fledgeby um, for various financial reasons and she confides this to Tremlow and tells Tremlow to warn Georgiana's father against her and to separate her and Georgiana so that Georgiana will not be forced to marry the awful man that is Fledgeby. And it's beautiful because Sophrania is selfish and mercenary and she kind of only cares about money but she does care about Georgiana and there's a moment of like real niceness and beauty always, the fact that actually this this woman who is not a nice woman has enough kindness in her that she is fond of Georgiana and that even if she is not a good person she wants to spare Georgiana from a life with Fledgeby. Mr Tremlow I implore you to save that child. It's lovely because partly it shows us a lot about kind of Mr Tremlow's strength of character, his kindness and his his belief in goodness that he wants to help her and that he wants to save Georgiana and even, even though he doesn't know her and this has kind of nothing to do with him he says yes because he is a good man and I do love Mr Tremlow but also it's really important in terms of telling us about Sophrania's character and the fact that she is not completely evil. It's also really interesting in terms of gender and the way Dickens perceives gender. Really fascinating. I think the Lamneys are really interesting to look at because in many ways they share a personality. They both care only about money. The way that they trick each other into marrying each other thinking that the other has a lot of money is very similar. It shows that they are very similar. They then aim to plot and scheme in order to get money. That is their plan and that is their aim in life. But it is very significant that Mrs Lamley, Sophronia Lamley, is less evil than Mr Alfred Lamley because it is, for Dickens, I think, bound up in gender. Morality and gender is another thing, like work and gender, that I find fascinating in Dickens. But for a lot of Victorian society, people like Dickens, people like Ruskin, and just a lot of society in general, women were more moral than men. They genuinely believed that women were more moral than men. And therefore, I think the Lamleys are really interesting to look at in terms of this, because they effectively had the same personality in male and female for Dickens. Obviously, like so many things in Dickens, the, the, the binaries split between men and women in Victorian fiction and Victorian culture is arbitrary and irritating and kind of annoying to look at, frustrating but also so fascinating. Like this is the thing, I, I find the presentation of men and women, the presentation of gender in Victorian literature at times disheartening but so interesting that it's also like okay well that's annoying but you know it, it's also fascinating to look at. The fact that for Dickens Mrs Lamley cannot be as bad as Mr Lamley because she is female and therefore she must have some kind of affection and goodness in her because that is what women are to Dickens which is frustrating and simplifying but also so interesting. So I hope you have all enjoyed the first half of Our Mutual Friend because we are up to the end now of book two out of the four books and I hope you have enjoyed February's chapters. In the month of March we'll be reading the first four chapters in book the third, A Long Lane, chapter one, 
lodgers in Queer Street. Chapter 2. A respected friend in a new aspect. Chapter 3. The same respected friend in more aspects than one. And chapter 4. A happy return of the day. I can't remember what happens in the beginning of book 3. I can't remember what any of those four chapters are about. So that is very exciting. But looking down to the end of book 3, I can see many, many exciting, beautiful chapters to come. And I'm very excited for the second half of Our Mutual Friend. I hope you're all enjoying the read-along so far and that you enjoyed this month's chapters. Thank you very much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.